Hello, everyone. Thanks, everybody, for being here and uh, kickstart the new year with a bright new seminar. So our guest uh, for the QMAT seminar series today is uh, Philip Rusman. Uh, Philip, uh, he had uh, his studies in, uh, in Germany, so he got his uh, uh, master and PhD in uh, Aachen. Oh, no, and joined with the University of Orleans. So, super reference. <laughs> and um, now he's currently postdoctoral researcher uh, in, uh, um, in based in Ulich. Uh, he's working on uh, superconductivity, topological materials, magnetic interaction, and the first principle of initial electronic structure theory. Uh, he's also working on the code development, so he is uh, one of the main developers of the Ubish uh, KKR code, which he will show the results in, uh, in the talk, and also how to uh, make, uh, let's say, high throughput uh, eventually, or um, a systematic way of, of performing simulation using the framework, which is called the uh, AIDA. Um, so that you can uh, not only run the simulation, but also do it in a systematic way and also do a systematic uh, um, stage of data and uh, use them for the future, which is also useful for open science. And I think uh, with this, uh, I will give you the floor. And we will be here listening to you. Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and uh, thank you all for being here uh, online and uh, in person. Uh, yes, I would like uh, to to tell you a little bit about uh, my work, uh, which is, uh, yeah, I'm a theorist, uh, so a theoretician, uh, and I do material simulations uh, based on density functional theory. And uh, this is uh, what I'm going to, to talk about today. I will yeah, try to use the, um, the virtual pointer so that also the, the online audience uh, can follow everything. And so before I, I start uh, speaking about uh, my research and uh, my work, uh, I would like uh, to not forget uh, about all the people who are, who are involved in this. So it's uh, not just me doing all this uh, research, but it's, uh, it's really a group effort and I have a lot of uh, yeah, close collaborations with, with a lot of people from different uh, universities and uh, different backgrounds. And of course, I would like to, to thank for, for funding um, for, for my research. So um, in, in our group, uh, we're actually yeah, trying to do uh, materials uh, for quantum information technology. So I, I think uh, I might be a quite a good uh, match to your QMAT uh, symposium here today. And um, so in particular, uh, uh, we are doing simulations for materials uh, based on uh, first principles electronic structure calculations of so density functional theory. And uh, in, in our methods, uh, often uh, kind of embedding of impurities and the role of defects uh, play an important role. However, this is not uh, uh, really what I will talk about today. Uh, what I will uh, speak about is uh, the aspect of superconductivity, which is quite a, uh, a challenging uh, thing to treat uh, in density functional theory, and uh, which is uh, what I focused on in the, in the past years in implementing this into our code, into our method. And um, so, uh, on an outer level, uh, this is what uh, uh, goes under the name of AIDA. Uh, this is also the, the high throughput approach of calculations, uh, which is kind of an outer level automating simulations. But this is just a technical detail, which I will also not cover today. So the, the quantum materials uh, which I'm interested in and uh, where also superconductivity plays the, the, the important role are actually um, so-called topological superconductors, uh, which is a, a platform where you can potentially realize a Majorana fermion. And uh, this can be useful for um, for more robust quantum computing in the future, but I will come to that uh, back in a moment. So um, um, I think not everybody here is a density functional theory expert, so let me very briefly give you a, an overview of uh, what density functional theory is. So in density functional theory, we do quantum mechanical simulations, and uh, so we basically take the, uh, the Schrodinger equation and uh, solve it uh, for the ground state, and um, we do this in a reformulation of the Schrodinger equation, which is the so-called Cohn-Sharn equation uh, written up here. Uh, this is the, the Hamiltonian, and so you express everything in a, for effective single electrons. So you have uh, electrons, it's just single electrons, a single electron picture in an effective potential. And this effective potential consists of um, 
the, the potential that's uh, the attractive potential that the, uh, the nuclei uh, have, uh, the positively charged nuclei have uh, in a crystalline lattice, uh, and then there's some some electron electron uh, repulsion. Uh, they, they, have, they have Coulomb repulsion uh, among them, and everything which goes beyond uh, these fairly simple terms uh, it goes into a, something that we call the exchange correlation function. And there, everything which is uh, more complicated than this goes in there, and this is then a complicated functional uh, of actually the electron density of all. And for this, we have uh, very successful uh, approximations uh, that allow us to do this uh, very efficiently and solve these uh, equations uh, again in a manner uh, that is uh, actually tractable on, uh, well, we need supercomputers, but uh, they are available uh, all over the world, and uh, so we are able to to predict a lot of um, a lot of properties, and uh, all this is connected then to the electronic structure of the materials. And uh, so you can, for example, compute uh, the electronic structure, and uh, yeah, this is also measured, uh, for example, with the angular result photo emission. And uh, so here there is an example where they they are laid on top of each other. Um, so uh, a specialty of the, the method in which we use is uh, that we can also deal with these uh, defects embedded in crystals, and uh, that allows us to also have access to scattering properties. So we can look at uh, how are electrons scattered of defects, which are embedded in, in some materials. And this is something that you can see in STM experiments, for example. Or we, are, we have access to um, uh, magnetic interactions, and we can predict uh, how do uh, magnetic atoms uh, order uh, if they are in a certain crystalline environment. And uh, this is something uh, which uh, can, for example, be, um, be be seen from angular results. Uh, uh, so the XMCD measurements, uh, this was not supposed to happen. Yeah. Uh, so I just need to restart my PowerPoints. Um, so now I have to see whether I'm still sharing my screen or not. <laughs> it's usually convenient to start a PowerPoint and then uh, share this. So and now you can share the screen. So maybe I share the entire screen. Probably. The entire <laughs> screen, yes. That's and now you, you can present from there presentation mode. Let's we'll see which view you see. Yeah. Okay. Um, Is there a video? Uh, there's no video embedded here. I'm <laughs> not sure what happens. <laughs> um, all right. So this, uh, uh, all these uh, things uh, which I will be talking about, uh, I implemented in the uh, in the Ulysses KKR code. Um, I have to find the pointer again. Um, so uh, the KKR is a special implementation of density functional theory, which expresses everything in terms of Green's functions and uses multiple scattering theory. These are all details which are not uh, too important today, um, but it is a, a method which uh, can do a relativistic uh, full potential and all electron uh, calculations. And so uh, maybe for potential users, it is. Uh, it is important to know that this is an open source code, so, so you can just go ahead and uh, download and use it. And um, so the, what I want to, to talk about is how we do uh, superconductivity uh, in this uh, density functional theory uh, approach. And uh, so we are in particular interested in the superconductivity because it is, uh, uh, for instance, uh, very important so for some uh, realizations of, uh, of qubits and uh, the materials that you need to do some quantum computation. In particular, I want to highlight uh, these two uh, approaches uh, to realizing a quantum computer, uh, which is on the top left here. Um, so now I see my... Here we have uh, superconducting qubits, uh, so superconductors are already in the name, and uh, there you build uh, circuits uh, which compose uh, of um, yeah, superconducting elements, uh, so-called Josephson junctions. So you have uh, uh, things like here on the top right, uh, interfaces between superconductors, uh, non-superconductors here, aluminum and aluminum oxide. And then again, a superconductor, again, aluminum. 
And uh, so you have uh, the interfaces between different materials and uh, the, the interface uh, chemistry and the ordering of the atoms, uh, disorder at these interfaces really plays an important role. And uh, another topic uh, is the yeah, topologically protected qubits. Uh, there you want to use uh, uh, topology to, to build a topological superconductor. And in there you can then realize uh, Majorana fermions. Uh, and these are then the building blocks for these Majorana qubits That's, um, that a lot of people are, are interested in. And uh, to realize uh, these topological superconductors, uh, we also have to combine different materials. Uh, for example, uh, you can take uh, semiconducting nanowires and proximitize them uh, with the superconductors, or you can use uh, topological insulators and uh, proximitize them uh, with uh, superconductors. So also there, we have different uh, interfaces between different materials. Uh, and so we want to, uh, to gain a better understanding really from the microscopic point of view from the electronic structure, which is directly connected to the arrangement of the atoms on the atomic scale. And uh, this is where our density functional theory method uh, comes into play. So I told you before that density functional theory is a single particle theory, an effective single particle theory. Um, but you probably remember from your lectures, uh, the basic lectures about superconductivity, that uh, in superconductors, uh, you have to build Cooper pairs. So you have to combine two uh, electrons uh, to build a Cooper pair. And uh, so uh, mathematically, we can do this uh, with the Bogolubov de Gen formalism. So we, we can write down um, the, the Hamiltonian we had before, or this, uh, this part here, the Cone Charm Hamiltonian. And so we write a, a second copy of it for our second particle, uh, this is the, the second line. And then we introduce some coupling called here D uh, between the the first and the second particle, so the, the U and the V in these equations. And uh, these are then these so-called uh, bogolyubov dijen equations, here expressed in terms of density function theory. So we have these effective potentials, so this D-effective and V-effective, uh, that are still single particle potentials, uh, and they are then all expressed in this uh, density function theory formalism. So uh, just uh, as before, we have um, uh, separated into the simple parts like the, the Coulomb interaction uh, among the electrons and everything which is more complicated uh, we put into the exchange correlation functional. Uh, this function is now a uh, functional of not just one density but uh, two densities uh, which is uh, yeah, reminiscent of uh, the fact that we, we have now have these two particles uh, that we need to combine to get the superconductivity and these are now uh, rho, this is the uh, charge density and then uh, chi, which is uh, the anomalous density or the superconducting density. And uh, well, you can then write down very complicated equations uh, for this. Uh, and um, so we can, for example, separate it into the, um, the normal exchange correlation function, uh, which just depends on the, the electron density, uh, which we are used to. And then we can use our, our typical approximations uh, that work uh, very well for yeah, a lot of uh, materials, and uh, which is the, the reason why density functional theory is so popular in, in this domain. Uh, but for the second part, uh, so there we have uh, put in um, the, the dependence on the anomalous density, on our superconducting density. Um, there we have to also introduce some simple approximation uh, that we can manage computationally, because this beast here would be far too complicated um, to, to solve. And uh, so we actually use uh, a quite simple approximation here, uh, which is uh, we assume that this superconducting pairing uh, is something uh, that is local in space. And we reduce it then uh, to a single number um, in, uh, that describes this local interaction in space. And then uh, the, the superconducting pairing uh, reduces to this very simple form uh, that we just have um, um, a coupling constant lambda, uh, which is multiplied to the um, to the anomalous density. And this then enters the Hamiltonian. And yes, there's a question here. Yeah, I have a question. Is it, is it obvious that you have to keep track of both the density and psi? I mean, like I'm thinking of this now more from a like field the like from a very different angle, field theory, and there we have this thing which is called Hubbard Satonovich transformation. Mm -hmm. It's essentially decoupling the interaction term. And there I would probably only keep the second. 
like your second part and not the one which is related to the density. Um, you mean in the in the upper equation here? Yeah. Only this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in this way we we express it in this way. Um, I think it is uh, equivalent to. So you could absorb the first part in this in the second part, and uh, and write it down uh, like that. Um, but we we introduce this because we we already have in mind uh, that uh, the, the superconducting. Uh, energy scale is much smaller than the typical electronic length uh, energy scale. So it's a small perturbation. And that's why um, we want to actually to start from the, the normal electronic structure. So by, by keeping this first part uh, and then only add the superconducting parts um, on top of it. Um, yes, so, so this uh, for us at the moment, uh, this uh, coupling constant lambda here is a uh, is a semi phenomenological parameter that's, uh, that we adjust. Um, but you can think of it uh, as um, yeah, in the typical BCS uh, theory of the superconductivity. Uh, there you have uh, to couple the Cooper pairs and you have an attractive interaction between these two electrons. And uh, this attractive interaction is mediated by phonons. So the electron phonon interaction mediates the attractive interaction. So this lambda parameter you can uh, view as the electron phonon coupling constants in the material that you can, can plug in here. And so, yes, then you, you can uh, uh, put the, this back in into the Hamiltonian and uh, solve for, for these uh, densities for the, the, the uh, charge density and uh, the anomalous density, which is also our superconducting order parameter here. And so to, uh, to summarize how this, this works, um, uh, we, we typically start with a normal calculation or normal density function theory calculation, which just takes uh, the cone charm Hamiltonian and doesn't know about the, the second particle of superconductivity. And uh, then uh, we, we choose uh, a set of these uh, lambda parameters for our material. And so uh, we then uh, uh, construct our Bogliubov Dijen Hamiltonian. Uh, solve, uh, after solving this, uh, we get uh, new densities. Uh, now we get two densities. The, charge density and the anomalous density. And this we then have to iterate over and over again until we reach uh, self-consistency. And, uh, and then we can um, compute uh, output uh, properties from there. We can look at, uh, at how does the band structure change uh, if you have a superconductor or the, the density of states or uh, look at the different things that we typically investigate with, with the density function theory. So uh, as I mentioned before, this uh, in our Implementation works with the green functions, but it's all equivalent uh, to just diagonalizing a Hamiltonian and uh, computing the eigenfunctions directly. But uh, I won't go into, into detail. Can I ask the one question? Yes. So is this done at the level of, of, of predefined orbitals that you're talking? Are these degrees of freedom or what's the ingoing degrees of freedom? Um, so for, for this, uh, I. I kind of get uh, the, the complete uh, complexity of the, the electronic structure that we get from density function theory. So you have uh, different bands in there, they have different orbital characters, uh, and, and all this I, I take over. And uh, then for the superconducting part, I then uh, um, can choose uh, kind of in space uh, the, these lambda parameters uh, for, for simple S wave, uh, singles coupling. Uh, this is just a single number uh, which I have to choose. And uh, then everything else uh, follows from this. And yeah, I think yeah, in, in a moment uh, we see how how these two things uh, come together and uh, and how what plays a role there. Um, but before I show you some uh, some application, I would briefly mention uh, the different energy scales uh, we are working with. And so, in typical uh, density functional theory uh, and, and material science, you have the energy scale of, of electron volts, uh, which is in the um, the formation of bonds uh, in your crystals and so on. And um, uh, so they, this is then reflected here in, in the density of states, for example, in, in this splittings of the different peaks uh, uh, in the density of states here. Uh, an example is shown for niobium. And so, um, so in, the, in the recent years, uh, also spin orbit coupling uh, uh, was very important, in particular for these uh, yeah, quantum materials. And so this is already a length an energy scale which is uh, typically much smaller uh, than the electronic 
the structure energy scale and the, the energy scale of bandwidth and so on. And uh, so it can be pretty small, but it can also be as large as uh, maybe 100 milliEV, as, as you can see, for example, in the splitting of the Rashba surface data on the surface of gold. The energy scale of superconductivity then uh, is again much smaller and uh, kind of a, a typical size of the superconducting gap is in the milli electron volt range, uh, for example, in, in niobium here, you see this example. So this uh, small energy scale that uh, we will need to resolve uh, also requires uh, that we put a lot of computational effort in. So we have uh, this extreme accuracy that we need to reach. Uh, so all the numerical parameters uh, and so on that's, that go in here also uh, need to be quite high to, to actually resolve all this and, and get everything uh, nicely converged. Mm -hmm. So I want to show you now uh, the example of, uh, of a simple superconductor, which is also a very important material in this search for, for these uh, Majorana uh, qubits. And uh, this is niobium. And niobium is, uh, for example, used to proximitize um, yeah, topological insulators, as seen here on, in sketch on the left, or it is uh, used as a, as a substrate uh, where then at, uh, magnetic atoms or chains of magnetic atoms are placed. And uh, this is then a realization of the uh, Kitayev chain, uh, where um, you then see signatures of these uh, Majorana uh, zero modes. So at the end of this chain, there's some, some zero bias peak, uh, which, uh, which could be the Majorana um, fermions uh, that we're looking for. So uh, let's take a look at the electronic structure of uh, niobium. So this is a typical spectrum that we get uh, after a normal density functional theory calculation. So you, you see on the left-hand side um, the uh, yeah, different path in, in the uh, different high symmetry, high symmetry path in the uh, uh, brilliant zone. And then there are a couple of bands uh, which uh, cross the, the Fermi energy. And now if we zoom in uh, to, to these crossings at the Fermi energy, uh, we have to go to this uh, milli electron uh, energy scale. And so if we then integrate all this uh, brilliant zone, we can compute uh, the density of states. Which is shown here on the on the right, and at the end of the day, we get uh, a superconducting gap uh, with our Bogliubov Dijen density functional theory, and uh, so we have the, the typical superconducting gap uh, that opens up. But if you uh, take a closer look at this, uh, you also see that uh, there's this additional feature that we see here. So we see this big coherence peak, and then there's a, a tiny one uh, here inside the the big gap, and uh, this actually re reflects. Uh, that we now have uh, all this complexity of, of the electronic structure in. So we have uh, some parts of the Brillouin zone uh, where the gap is slightly smaller. So in some of these uh, crossings, uh, uh, we have a slightly smaller gap. And uh, this then leads to this uh, small feature uh, that we see here inside so the, the major uh, uh, gap uh, that we have here. And um, so uh, we can compare this uh, then, uh, for example, to uh, um, to experiments, here's the same data I showed you earlier. Uh, this is an STM measurement of a niobium surface, where you nicely see uh, that this uh, superconducting gap opens up. However, at this uh, temperature of uh, a little bit larger than one Kelvin, uh, this side feature, um, uh, small gap anisotropy, uh, is actually not visible. Um, and so, so we can then also take our results and uh, compute this at, uh, with uh, some temperature smearing, which is comparable to this uh, one Kelvin. And then actually this feature is, it is too close to the main Korean speed to be resolved anymore. And uh, you can actually then take uh, this orange line and put it really on top of this one. And so, so the, the shape and the height of the Korean speed and all this uh, fits very nicely. Uh, we get uh, to, to this agreement uh, by, by just tuning a single number. So we just have this, uh, uh, this lambda parameter, the, the strength of our electron phonon coupling, um, which we should change. And uh, this then changes the overall scale of our superconducting gap. Um, but everything else, like uh, this gap anisotropy, the second peak that we have in our density of states, uh, this is then all a prediction of the theory. And we only have to adjust this one single number or, or calibrate our, uh, our calculation to, to this specific material. And um, so we can then actually do this. Uh, yes. I have a question. Uh, so you, your 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 chi parameter 
uh, or also the role is a uh, is spatially dependent, right? How, how do you treat this in practice? Like how how large of a system or unit cell do you? So for for this uh, niobium, it is uh, just a periodic. You have periodic boundary conditions, and then you can work with a very small uh, unit cell. And um, so in in practice, it depends on really what you want to uh, to calculate. So in the next example, which I will show, actually has a, is also niobium, but a thin film. And uh, there, I think we had 21 uh, layers. Um, but that is uh, by f yeah, quite far from, from the limit uh, that we can do. So we can also do like um, 100 or 200 atoms uh, in our unit cell. And, um, and uh, yeah, look at, at larger um, yeah, heterostructures, for example. Um, yes, so when you when you're dealing with these more complicated systems, also the, the band structures uh, get more more complicated, and we have this typically. Yeah, yes. Do you also get like can can you also determine critical temperatures in this approach and compare it to the experiment? Uh, yes. So, so if um, so, we yes we have to calculate uh, the comp proper size of our lambda parameter of our electron phonon coupling constant. And uh, but once uh, we have that, uh, so the um, kind of the formula is how we get uh, our uh, anomalous density, uh, the Fermi function enters. So you, you can plug in a temperature there. And if you're if the temperature is larger than the, the critical temperature, um, then during the self consistency, this uh, will just uh, vanish and we will go to the trivial solution, the non superconducting solution, which is also always a solution to the Boolean oxygen. And in principle, you can also compute uh, this electron phonon coupling constants uh, from up initio and uh, use that uh, directly. And, and then you get rid of this, this freedom of choice of, of this lambda parity. But that will be uh, to compute the, from first principle uh, the lambda that this is not within the UHKKR, you would need another. Uh, yes, so then you, like need, uh, code. you need uh, another code uh, where this is implemented, uh, uh, where this yeah, density functional perturbation theory yeah. uh, is implemented. And for this. The, so this is for conventional superconductivity, but for the. Yes, so, so the, this Bokulu of the Gen approach. Uh, so in, in principle, this lambda can be more complex than a single number. And so, so you can put in also things uh, which uh, give you different terms, uh, which uh, go beyond uh, the, the BCS theory. So for, for this approach where you pre-compute uh, the, this lambda parameter and plug that in, uh, then you need to know it is um, a conventional superconductor where electron phonon interaction is there. Is uh, what is uh, responsible for the superconducting coupling. If you have a material where you, know, for example, also have magnetic atoms, uh, and then uh, the magnetic fluctuations uh, can also play an important role in determining how this uh, this coupling uh, actually looks like and so what's uh, what its size is. So that is, it, it then has its limitations. Yes. Because the DFT doesn't know anything about the phonons or anything like that. It knows about the electrons and no, yes. it's the phonons, well, but uh, you, you need to know. Uh, the problem is that you need to know um, what is the mechanism. Yeah, that's what I mean. It doesn't know about the phonons because it only knows about the phonons through lambda. No, you can calculate the phonons. So in principle, you can calculate the, the phonons. The functional perturbation theory or other techniques, you can, you can add that to the addition. So that you can yeah. predict. Okay. That you can predict. Yes. You can think of uh, moving the, the atoms a little bit in, in that way, implementing the phonons. Yes. Um, so yes, uh, so in these uh, kind of thin films, uh, the, the electron structure gets uh, much more complicated and it's quite tedious to, to investigate uh, these, uh, these spaghetti plots uh, that we draw here. So they are, uh, we often uh, look at uh, the uh, uh, spatially resolved uh, density of states. Uh, this is shown here now um, for the first three layers of a 21 layer niobium uh, thin film. And you see that uh, so the, the top uh, one here is the, 
the outermost, uh, the surface layer, and then we go a little bit deeper and to see that uh, there are some some changes uh, to the electronic structure. These peaks change, and they approach the the, the bulk electronic structure. And uh, so we were wondering, uh, okay, these changes uh, that we have here uh, for this system, which now has a broken symmetry, how does it affect actually the superconducting state? And if you uh, compute uh, the, the superconducting uh, gap in, in this uh, in the system, also layer by layer, we actually find uh, that it it looks the same. So the, the superconductivity is very robust against this. Uh, so we always have uh, the same size of the gap in, in these different layers, even though the electronic structure locally differs quite a lot. And uh, so we can understand this in this uh, superconducting material with the size of the coherence length, superconducting coherence length, uh, which is way larger than the interatomic distances uh, between the uh, the layers. So this uh, then the length scale will, over which uh, you average out um, all the electronic structure, which is important for the superconductivity, and over this length scale you then average out the the superconducting gap. Yes. So before you said that you have uh, selected uh, chosen lambda, so to have the right uh, width the superconducting gap. Yes. Then uh, it's a bit imposed by construction that you are going to have the same uh, gap. So uh, no. So here you have uh, even if you use uh, the same lambda parameter in, in all the layers, uh, you still have uh, that the the local electronic structure or the Let's see the, the density of states at the Fermi energy uh, is different in, in one layer compared to the next one. And so, so the, you need this density of states at the electronic structures. And these are the electrons which can form the Cooper pairs. So the locally, the, the strength of the superconducting coupling uh, is different. But it then averages out uh, due to the interaction and they, they, all, they all talk to each other. And then uh, how do you choose uh, the lambda for the layer structure because it's different from the box. So yes, so here we are. Uh, because in the box, you know from the experiment what, what should be the gap. Yes. But for the, I don't know, 20 layer of diopium, I don't think there is an experiment. So yeah. how do you choose the lambda? So here we, um, we compare different approaches, uh, very simple approximations to just uh, take the bulk lambda everywhere. And so this then uh, leads to results that, that look uh, the same like this. And another approach is uh, that you have smaller changes in this lambda parameter, uh, which you can trace back to the, the phonon spectrum, uh, how the phonons change in the surface. Uh, so there, I think in Niobium, there's a phonon softening at the surface, softening of the uh, phonon modes. And this then uh, affects uh, the, the size of this electron phonon coupling parameter. So locally, there, there's some changes uh, which we also tried, but still, uh, we, we always get uh, the same answer that uh, the gap looks the same. There, there was another question. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of related, but um, so is it, is it too naive to, to I mean, in, in the end, you have an isolated PCS superconductor, right? So, and uh, basically, it's the density of states at the Fermi level that determines the gaps. And uh, if, if I look at your blocks, it's the same for all layers, right? So it's not, not really the the coherence length that is the decisive or but if you take a, a close look at these values uh, then they they are different enough that you would expect a change because uh, this uh, um yeah for these uh, bcs uh, type yeah, superconductors it is exponential the, the speed has changed and um, so you would have expected a much larger change if it's just the um the size of the electron form interaction uh, times the um, density of states at the Fermi energy. And uh, also in, in other materials uh, where you have um, yeah, like two different atoms in your unit cell, uh, you can have uh, very different electronic uh, um, structures coming from the, these two components and then a much higher density of states in, in one atom uh, compared to the other. And, and still, we see these kind of effects uh, that it averages out um, over um, over much larger length scales. Um, so now I, I come to to the main part uh, of what I want to show you, 
And uh, this is actually a, a heterostructure um, between a, a superconductor and a non-superconductor, in particular, yeah, a topological insulator. And uh, yeah, I mentioned in, in the beginning uh, that this uh, topological insulator superconductor heterostructure is, um, is one way of achieving a topological superconductor and uh, a platform for, for Majorana qubits. And uh, this uh, has been investigated also uh, quite early on after um, the first predictions uh, for this, and it, uh, it was shown, or some indications uh, were seen, that uh, first of all, it is uh, possible to proximitize the topological insulator with the superconductor. However, um, uh, this was uh, yeah, more than 10 years ago now, uh, but we still don't have a, have a topological qubit, uh, so there, um, there must be some challenges on the way. And um, so we wanted to take a closer look and really apply our uh, the atomistic simulations uh, to these kind of interfaces. And uh, so we, we set out and uh, combined niobium, the same superconductor we uh, talked about earlier, and uh, added an interface to a topological insulator. So here it is uh, bismuth telluride, this is the topological insulator. It contains all these quintuple layers of uh, bismuth and uh, tellurium atoms. And then uh, we stacked uh, different uh, thicknesses of the TI on top of uh, the, uh, the S-wave superconductor. And um, uh, so in, if you then analyze the, the electronic structure of this, um, you see now here three lines uh, for in the density of states plots. Um, these are integrated over different regions of, uh, of the simulation cell. Uh, so you have uh, the, the green line, which is uh, the electronic structure from the niobium. There's an, an orange line, which is the electronic structure integrated over the what I call the contact quintuple layer. So this is the quintuple layer, which is in contact with the superconductor. And then on the uh, far side here, uh, away from the superconductor, it is the, the blue line, so the free quintuple layer. And uh, you see some there are some distinct changes. Uh, so the, in particular, if you compare the, the blue and the orange line, and uh, there's a shift here, and uh, there are some states uh, which kind of mirror states from the niobium. And uh, these are effects uh, of, of hybridization between the niobium and the topological insulator. And um, in particular, we also find uh, that there's some significant electron doping. So we have uh, this, this metal, the niobium, which is in contact to a topological insulator, which is uh, basically a semiconductor. And uh, so this uh, contact, uh, they, are, they have very different work functions. And then you have uh, quite a large number of electrons uh, which can hop from the, the metal into the topological insulator and uh, induce a, quite a strong electron doping there, uh, which uh, pulls up the the Fermi level in the topological insulator into the conduction bed. So this uh, we can see if we investigate uh, the electronic structure. And uh, to make it a little bit easier to, to see what is going on in, in these kind of plots, I, I draw a little sketch. So the, the topological insulator has an electronic structure that uh, looks like this. Here you have, uh, uh, down here you have uh, the, um, the valence bands uh, and up here the conduction band in the bulk of the topological insulator. And uh, it is called a topological insulator because the Fermi level lies somewhere in between. And uh, then on the on the surface we have this topological surface state uh, that that must be there if you have this interface between a topological material and a non-topological material. And um, so this is uh, the electronic structure how it looks like if we just have a perfect freestanding topological insulator. If we then uh, put niobium in contact to, to this uh, topological insulator, um, we have this electron transfer from the niobium to the topological insulator. So the Fermi level now is dragged up here into the conduction band. And also the states hybridize. So the, the electronic structure, the dispersion of our topological surface state uh, is affected quite strongly by the bands and the, the interaction between the states from niobium and um, the, the topological surface state, which is in the region, that lived in the region very close to this contact. And uh, so this is then uh, there are quite severe effects uh, if you have a topological insulator film which is uh, thick enough so that uh, you can see gradual changes in the band structure. So uh, uh, what you see here now is um, the electronic structure um, for a, a 10 quintuple layer, so 10 nanometer thick uh, topological insulator, which is in contact uh, with this niobium superconductor. 
And uh, so this uh, site here, which is uh, 10 nanometer away from the contact, um, does not feel too much about, about this contact uh, because there, there's a bike insulating region uh, here uh, separating the, the left-hand side from the right-hand side where we, where we have the contact to the neighbor wheel. So there we have the electronic structure as sketched here where the, the family level lies uh, somewhere inside the, the, the bike band gap. And uh, we only have the topological surface stage crossing the film image. If we then uh, approach the, um, uh, the niobium contact, we actually see that uh, the effect of this charge doping, which happens at this interface, uh, pulls up the, the Fermi energy, and it uh, then gradually changes and is pushed up into this uh, conduction band here. And uh, the dispersion of the topological surface, it also is uh, strongly affected. Um, pulling up uh, the Fermi energy here uh, also leads uh, to, a, to a local variation uh, of the chemical potential. And uh, so you therefore uh, build up a quantum well uh, at this interface region. And uh, this is actually also then populated, uh, as you can see here uh, in the, the rightmost uh, image here of the band structure. So this state that is populated here around the gamma point uh, that is actually a quantum well state uh, that lives uh, uh, in this interface region because uh, there's this band bending effect that happens there. Um, so what does this now mean for the, the superconducting state and the proximity effect that we have there? To, to model the, uh, the superconducting state, uh, we now have our superconductor where we choose our uh, non-zero lambda parameter. So the, that's how we, we pick up our superconductivity. And then we set this lambda parameter to zero in the topological insulator. So all the, the gaps that we see in, in bands, uh, which, uh, which are living in the topological insulator, uh, they come from the proximity effect and from, from Cooper pairs that can leak from the, uh, from the superconductor into the topological insulator. And uh, so they, you see then here the different uh, bands in particular, I want to focus your attention on, on this one here, the, the one which is highlighted in green. Um, yeah, that is, um, I should say, you know, I, I showed the same electronic structure in two ways. Uh, first, I just uh, highlight, uh, show, just uh, show the bands and you see some superconducting gaps opening up. And, uh, and then on the right hand side, I showed the same bands, but the color coding is how much do they contribute to the superconductivity or how much do they take part in superconductivity. And uh, so one message is here, we can proximitize this state here, which is the topological surface state that lives in this interface region. We can proximitize it uh, quite well. So there, that is uh, kind of a positive message uh, about uh, this material combination. Um, but uh, there are also these quantum well states, uh, which only show a very small gap. And then this state here, uh, highlighted in, in purple, this is actually the topological surface state on the far side away from the contact. And um, uh, this is actually completely decoupled from the superconductor. It does not see any of the Cooper pairs. They, they cannot go in there. And uh, then the state also does not uh, pick up a superconducting gap. And so, so this is really um, yeah, uh, reflected in, in the localization of all these uh, wave functions and um, how much uh, the Cooper pairs can tunnel into the respective states. Um, so, uh, how much time do I have left? So, <laughs> Five, ten minutes, depends how much you want. Yes, it's, been, uh, <laughs> it's true that we interrupted you on the way. Then I will uh, just briefly also cover uh, yeah, another aspect in these topological insulator materials, uh, which is uh, uh, a very challenging for, for this material platform, uh, which is, uh, so these materials, uh, I showed you the ideal case so far, where in the topological insulator, the, the Fermi level lies in the bulk band gap. However, if you really grow these materials, uh, they are not insulating. So they, they are not really a topological insulator, but the Fermi level due to uh, defects, uh, there are some anti-sides, vacancies, and so on, um, all this uh, leads uh, to, a, to a natural doping of these crystals if you actually make them in reality. 
And uh, then there are different topological insulators uh, which show different trends. So the telluride is more N-doped and antimony telluride is more P-doped. So you can combine these materials and uh, get a compensation uh, of, of these effects and finally end up uh, with a bulk insulating sample. However, this uh, also uh, introduces some, um, some local variations and uh, this is the Fermi level and the concentrations change locally in, in space when you when you fabricate uh, these materials. And uh, this typically uh, leads to the formation of so-called charged puddles. So you have regions which are positively charged, other regions which are negatively charged. And uh, this is a, a big uh, material challenge uh, that we have uh, with these uh, kind of materials. So we, we wanted to know um, how does uh, this now affect uh, the superconducting proximity effects in this interface? And we did this uh, by considering or comparing three different calculations, uh, the ideal calculations uh, which I had before, uh, and then uh, starting from a topological insulator which is uh, P or N doped. So uh, from before we we made this contact uh, to the superconductor, we we forced uh, the the Fermi level to be uh, in the conduction or the, the valence band. And um, so we we can do this uh, and uh, compare the the different locations of the Fermi level in these materials, and uh, finally computes um, the uh, the electronic structure. The, the lower panel here is now the uh, the situation where the Fermi level uh, originally lies in the valence band of the topological insulator. Then um, the the electron doping, which happens there, uh, pulls it up a little bit uh, just to the edge, and um, so we we see the then also that uh, the topological surface state uh, highlighted here in green, which lives uh, in this contact area, is still very well proximitized. And this uh, uh, this is the same situation as um, as in the, the one I, I discussed earlier. And it is also there uh, if we have um, now uh, a topological insulator that uh, has its starting Fermi level in the conduction bed. So then this topological surface state is always very well proximitized. However, this, uh, all these uh, quantum well states uh, that we have in this uh, thin film, um, they are generally hard to proximitize if we have uh, uh, these perfect interfaces uh, that are modeled here. So there are, there is uh, mixed messages uh, about uh, the applicability of, uh, of this material platform to actually realize uh, a topological superconductor. On the one hand, uh, you have uh, a quite robust proximity effect in the state in which you want to, to proximitize. So the topological surface state, so that is where you need to open up the gap to, to get into the topological superconducting phase. However, we have all the other states around, like quantum well states that form and uh, which are generally uh, decoupled from the superconducting electronic structure and uh, which uh, that could be harmful if you actually want to realize um, uh, yeah, a qubit uh, based on this material platform. Question. Uh, uh, yes. So, so now you've talked about what happens on the topological insulator side, but not what happens with niobium. So, and judging from your image, it looks like the niobium is kind of semi-infinite. Yes. So, is that also what is that? Um, is it treated as a fixed? So here it was a, a couple of layers of niobium. Right. Um, so it was not uh, semi-infinite. Um, but, but should one expect a back reaction on the superconductor side as well? In, in principle, uh, you have uh, the kind of the inverse proximity effect uh, that you would ex expect. That uh, in the in the region at the surface, uh, you also have the, this back action uh, that the the superconducting gap is uh, decreases a little bit. Um, however, we, on the other hand, uh, we have uh, the effect uh, that uh, the superconductivity kind of averages out of a, of a long uh, length scale. And this uh, kind of counteracts this and uh, makes it uh, more robust. So I, I did not put any results on that in here, but uh, we see a little bit of this inverse proximity effect, but it is uh, it is not very strong for this particular interface. That's superconductor dependent as well. Yes, it would uh, depend uh, very much on which superconductor you take, yeah. I mean, probably it's also because the Density of states on the surface of the topological insulator should be quite low. Yes. So I, I would expect that the effect is very 
Uh, yes, you really have a, a good metal. Uh, so the, the Nyoma with the superconductor, before it gets superconducting, it's really good metal with a high density of states. Uh, and the topological insulator, so the, the ideal one uh, at the Fermi level just has the topological, so just a single state at the Fermi energy. So, um, and that's also why the putting the, these electrons uh, when you have this contact between the superconductor and the topological insulator, why it has such a drastic change in the electronic structure. So yeah, you have a, a few electrons and then very small uh, electronic um, or density of states in the, super, in the topological insulator. Uh, which cannot effectively screen this. So it, you need to push it up into the conduction and where you then have a lot of states which can do the screening. Yes. I mean, is it, is it fair? Is it, I think it goes into that direction. But is it fair? I mean, graphene is also known for having these charged bubbles. Yes. Right? And it's, it's the same effect, is it? Yes. Because it's just such a low density of states. It's a very low density of states, and then it's uh, quite easy to uh, kind of move into the uh, conduction or, or the valence bands and uh, end up uh, with a situation where locally you have uh, a little bit higher concentration of this uh, element, and then there you have a little bit higher concentration of that element or defect, and uh, then you have this the formation of these charge puddles. Yes. So yeah, with that, uh, I also would like to, to conclude. So I, I introduced our, uh, our implementation of the, the Boulogne of Dijon formalism into uh, the density functional theory, which allows us to, to describe uh, superconductors and heterostructures made out of superconductors and non-superconductors. And in particular, I, I wanted to, to show you some results on uh, for, for material platform that might be useful in, in quantum computing, but they are still a lot of open questions and uh, a lot of hurdles we have to, to get out of the way to actually get there, a lot of material challenges and it's, uh, that we need to overcome. And uh, I think uh, their first principles calculations uh, can be very helpful in, in understanding what is going on on this atomic scale and uh, in trying to correlate uh, the local atomic structure to the electronic structure and then also the, the superconducting properties. And uh, just to give you a, a very brief outlook of uh, what we're also doing. And so I mentioned uh, that so far we looked at this perfect interface, uh, but we also have uh, the technology of uh, doing defects and uh, intermixing at these interfaces. Uh, so this is something uh, we are studying right now and uh, where we really want to, to investigate uh, does uh, intermixing at these interfaces, is it, um, is it harmful or maybe even beneficial to achieve a, a more stable superconducting proximity effect if you have some of the niobium atoms uh, which can also go into the topological insulator side. And um, yeah, the, the other approach uh, that we're also looking at is uh, to build uh, these chains of, of atoms on, on surfaces of superconductors, the uh, chains of magnetic atoms, and um, in investigate uh, so-called uh, yushiba rusinov states, uh, which, uh, which are bound states uh, and the building blocks um, to, to get it by Irana uh, fermions starting from magnetic atoms uh, on surfaces. So they are, yeah, they are kind of states that live inside the superconducting gap and you, you break up your, your Cooper pairs uh, into spin up and spin down electrons. And uh, these are then the states that you see appearing inside the superconducting gap. And yes, uh, with that, uh, I'm, I'm at the end of my presentation. And yeah, thank you all for your attention. Are there more questions? So, <clears throat> how deep does the superconduction then penetrate of what you say? How many layers deep does it go? Um, so, here, um, so yes, we, we looked at the different uh, thicknesses of these uh, topological insulators and uh, so if, if you're speaking about uh, kind of how, when do you stop seeing the, the um, uh, superconductivity in the, in the electronic structure, which is local to the mm -hmm. kind of the free side, mm -hmm. um, then it happens uh, once the, the, the top and the bottom surfaces are decoupled. So after six, seven, eight uh, multiple layers, uh, then 
starting from the, the context side. From yes, the side. so from the context side, uh, and then the, the free side, uh, so if it is like eight mm. or so, then, then it's, you hardly see a gap uh, in the simulations. However, in, the, yeah, in, in a lot of experiments, uh, they can still see something, even for uh, like 10 nanometers uh, thick. And so we're still not quite sure where that is coming from. Uh, it's, it could be that uh, this intermixing uh, really plays uh, an important role in kind of uh, allowing to to proximitize uh, much deeper yeah. than, than what we have seen here. Maybe a follow up question. So there's a lot of charge transfer from the niobium to the TI. In this case, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, so it uh, depends uh, where you start from. If you start with the topological insulator, which uh, uh, has its Fermi level lying in the in the valence band, and then it can actually be a good thing and uh, just pull it up uh, into the um, into the bike band gap. So you can yeah, also sure. think about kind of functionalizing this effect. Thanks. Thanks. This is the moment that after we will be gone. There are no more questions. I think uh, we had uh, several during the discussion, so I think we call on one well, just, 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 <laughs> just for what's called benchmarking. So you, you've said several times this is superconductor, supercomputer calculation test, yes. right? So what does that mean to you? I mean, what are we talking about for this? Let's say the archive behind you doing these kind of classic plots. What's so this uh, weeks, months, uh, days, what's the scale here? So luckily uh, our code is, is quite well parallelized. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you have a big computer, uh, then, then you can do it. Um, but so to, to give you a feeling, uh, so if you have uh, like a normal density functional theory calculation for what you always have to do, um, for these kind of big systems where you maybe have like a hundred atoms or so, uh, this, is, uh, this already takes a while to compute, and uh, you, you typically have uh, kind of several nodes or um, say a few hundred cores that you use at the same time, and then and maybe in a, in a few days uh, you didn't have the, the converged calculation. And uh, then for the, the superconducting calculation, um, we have to to increase all the, the numerical accuracy and everything, uh, which makes it much. Uh, much more costly because also you have a, a doubling in, in all the matrices. You have the, right. all these electron hole uh, components which you need to take care of. Um, so on the, the individual calculation for the superconducting part is then like a factor of five to ten or so slower. So you need to to, to increase either the, the runtime or yeah. the, the resources. Yes, and yeah, that's. Where it gets expensive because um, yeah, typically we then uh, run kind of the second loop of uh, of self consistency iterations. Right. The so, so that's usually well. what you would do. You would first run, you would run for lambda equals zero, find your yes. normal band structure, and then you turn off lambda, and then you run yes. another one. So you could you could uh, first start to, to get the feeling of what is happening by just uh, kind of put a, a constant in the superconductor, a constant coupling, and just run one step. And then, then you have a result. Um, but if you really want to, to, to properly also get like the, these proximity effects, the inverse proximity effect, uh, the kind of spec action to the superconductor, then I believe you, it is much better to actually do the self consistency and and take all this into account. I would say what takes so much time is not just a single final calculation; it's all your preparation uh, that you but, do before uh, okay, to, yeah, yeah. To, to find, uh, you know, because you have to converge all the parameters that you use, and this takes a while. And the system are large, so that takes uh, very easily months uh, or a year. Uh, That's uh, uh, roughly. You calibrate more. when you're ready. You press go, and then you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well. Uh, <laughs> But easily takes a year of work uh, yes. like that after the code is uh, debugged and stable and working. But <laughs> if you have enough computing resources, uh, like yeah, this IDEA infrastructure, which uh, I didn't really talk about today, um, that allows you to automate uh, this tasks. parameter search. Uh, yeah. And so you can really run a lot of calculations uh, simultaneously. Yeah. And 
and yeah, finally you have them all of them running, and then this is the one there which which yeah, works. Uh, then uh, so the, the beauty of this idea is that you also get full reproducibility. So you have kind of all the steps in between uh, that you can get from this final result. They are they are all connected in, in a database, and so that is um, that is also very useful for to, to get this kind of as open science as as reproducible as possible. Yeah, I think that uh, with the word on open science, uh, we <laughs> can uh, <laughs> happily close. Uh, and thank you for uh, your presentation. Yeah, thank you.